Hi everybody and welcome to this MVOS Academy class on how to cultivate healthy boundaries for a truly authentic life. My name is Hannah Braim. I am a coach and founder of a website called Becoming Who You Are, which you can find at becomingwhoyouare.net. And I help people live lives where what they're doing on the outside reflects who they really are on the inside. And that's exactly what we're going to be talking about today with this class on cultivating healthy boundaries. So before I dive in to the 10 big ideas that I want to share with you today, um, I just want to talk for a few moments about what boundaries are and why they matter. So why are they important for living an authentic life? So in a nutshell, the very simple definition of boundaries is that they help us let the good in and keep the bad out. So I'll just say that again, because it's very simple, but this is what they are. They let the good in and they keep the bad out. So there's two main types of boundaries that I'm going to be talking about today. The first type is boundaries with other people. So this is when we hear about boundaries, this is usually what we think about. We think about um, how we show up in relationships, things like setting boundaries between work and personal life and all that really important stuff. And there's also a second type of boundaries that I'm going to talk about, which are equally as important, but that sometimes we can overlook when we focus just on boundaries with other people. And this is boundaries with ourselves. So when I say boundaries with ourselves, what I mean are things like time management. You know, do we spend our time in a way that is aligned with our values and our priorities? Do we keep the commitments that we make to ourselves? Do we do what we say we're going to do when we say we're going to do it? And stuff like that that is really fundamental to our own feelings of self-trust. And, you know, all of that stuff really counts towards, you know, how do we show up in our relationships and in our lives? Do we show up with authenticity? So boundaries are super important um, overall, just because when we have healthy boundaries um, and when we cover the 10 ideas that I'm going to share with you in this class, um, these healthy boundaries have a profoundly positive impact, not only on our relationships with other people, but also on our relationships with ourselves. So on that note, let's dive in to big idea number one, which is remember that boundaries are beautiful. So as I said in the introduction, boundaries let the good in and they keep the bad out. And in that way, they really protect and nurture us. So when we think about boundaries, when we think about the word boundary, we might have a vision in our minds. I don't know what you think of, but I sometimes think of boundaries like a wall or a fence. When I hear that word boundary, it's a dividing line between one thing and another. So when we think about boundaries in relationships, we might think of it as something that separates us from other people. But the really, really counterintuitive thing about healthy boundaries is that when we can cultivate healthy boundaries in relationships, we can actually have more intimate relationships. So the reason for this is that sometimes when it comes to emotional and psychological boundaries, um, where those boundaries are or identifying those boundaries can get quite murky. If you think of our physical boundaries, you know, we all have a layer of skin and that is a very, very clear physical boundary that shows where we end and where the air or the world around us begins. When it comes to emotional and psychological boundaries, however, especially when we're in a very close relationship with someone else, those lines where we end and where the other person begins might be harder to define. So when we have healthy boundaries, it helps us become more intimate with other people just because we have a very strong sense of security. We have a very strong sense of where we end, where the other person begins. And we also have a very clear idea of what are our feelings, what our needs are, and what our values are, and then what the other person's feelings are, what the other person's needs are, and what the other person's values are too. One of the great things about being human and one of the most special things is that we are conscious beings. You know, we have a really strong sense of self and sense of identity. When we don't have healthy boundaries, it's one of the biggest threats to our sense of self because we risk taking on other people's feelings, other people's values, and ultimately living somebody else's life and a life that is not true to ourselves. 
But when we have the safety and the security of healthy boundaries, we can actually get closer to other people and develop more intimate relationships with them because we feel safe in the knowledge that we will always have ourselves. We will always be able to keep hold of ourselves as individuals. So along with that idea around healthy boundaries, helping nurture more intimate relationships. I just want to spend a few moments talking about the word no. So this is often the word that we associate with boundaries, particularly in relation to other people. And a lot of us really struggle with the word no. We might feel kind of bad about saying it. We don't want to hurt other people's feelings. It might be a very uncomfortable word for us to say. But ultimately, saying no is a part of healthy boundaries and it is a part of living an authentic life. So I wanted to share a slight shift in perspective that you might find helpful when thinking about saying no that can make it feel a little bit more lighthearted, a little bit more positive. So that idea is that every time we say no to something, we are saying yes to something else. So I'll just say that again so it really sinks in. Every time we say no to something, we are saying yes to something else. So if I say no to a work project, I might be saying yes implicitly within that no to more time to spend with my partner or more free time for myself or more time to spend on other projects that are a better fit for me and are more aligned with what my priorities are right now. So whenever you're faced with a situation when you need to say no, I'd really invite you just to take a step back, take a deep breath and think, OK, when I say no to this, what is it that I'm really saying yes to? And put that as the priority in your mind as you go forth and as you set that boundary in your own life. So in this way, boundaries help us live according to our highest principles and values. In a sense, sticking to healthy boundaries is like staying on a track in a jungle. You know, it keeps us clear, it keeps us on a very clear path towards getting to where we want to get to and doing so in a way that is right for us. Big idea number two, boundaries are an art, not a science. Part of the reason why boundaries can feel very difficult and a little bit intangible when it comes to explaining what they are and what they might look like in your life is that there are very few rules when it comes to boundaries. And this is part of their challenge and it's also part of their charm. So boundaries are different for everybody. Each individual has very, very different boundaries that are influenced by a number of things in our lives. Personality. So for example, if you are an introvert and you get your energy from spending time alone, you probably have quite different boundaries from someone who is an extrovert and gets that energy from spending time with other people. Equally, um, your career might affect your boundaries as well. Um, I know for myself, I used to work for um, a charity that helps stalking victims in the UK. And in that role, I had a very, or I was a lot more conscious of my boundaries, certainly, than when I was doing customer service for a software company. Like, very different role with different demands, different context, and that really affected my sense of boundaries. Our boundaries might also be affected by our communities, so by the people around us, and also by our past experiences and our history. So when it comes to boundaries, I really invite you to play around and experiment. And I use the word play very deliberately there because sometimes boundaries can feel like quite a heavy topic and quite a serious topic. And actually, it really doesn't have to be. It can be a source of real joy, expansion and possibility in our lives. So really play around, experiment and discover what the art of boundaries looks like for you. Big idea number three. Boundaries are gates, not walls. So as I said earlier, I don't know about you, but when I used to think about boundaries, I would have the image of like a wall or some kind of fence or barrier coming up in my mind. And that's really, really common. You know, we tend to think of boundaries as walls and that can lend itself to this idea that if we have boundaries in relationships, we're actually separated from people. Whereas, as I said earlier, having healthy boundaries actually helps us become closer to other people and develop more intimate relationships because we have that safety. We know that our integral sense of self is protected and safe. So the problem with thinking about boundaries as walls is that if you think of a wall, a wall is there to keep everything out. 
Whereas, as we've already talked about, boundaries are there to let the good in and to keep the bad out. So they keep some things out, but they also let other things in. And in that way, they are more in that way, they are more like gates or doors than they are like walls. More than that, they're gates that we can control. We have complete control and we get to decide what we let in and what we keep out. So instead of being a wall, think of your boundaries as a gate or a door and you are the doorman or the gatekeeper who gets to decide what comes in and what has to stay out. Big idea number four, care for someone rather than taking care of them. So what really underpins boundaries is respect. And that is respect both for our own capability as an individual and our individuality as well, and respect for other people's individuality and capability too. So the difference between caring for someone and taking care of them is very subtle, but very important. And I just wanna do a quick exercise to illustrate the difference here. So if you imagine that a friend comes to you with a situation that is not life shatteringly bad, but it's, you know, they're pretty upset about it. It's a pretty big deal to them. And you can respond in one of two ways. So this is the first response. Wow, that sounds really hard. I'm so, so sorry to hear about that. I'd really love to support you. I'm here to talk it through with you. Um, what do you think you need the most right now? Or what do you think would be most helpful for you right now? So that's response number one. Response number two is, oh my God, that's appalling. Uh, you know, have you tried this? Have you tried that? You know what, actually give me that person's number. I'm gonna call them up for you. And I'm gonna tell them that what they're doing to you is absolutely appalling. Okay, so it's kind of an over exaggeration, but I think you can see the difference between uh, caring for someone, uh, which in other words means being there to support them and love them with the knowledge that they will do what's right for them and taking care of them. Um, and taking care of them basically means taking responsibility for them, taking responsibility for their feelings, for their issues, for fixing their problems, for meeting their needs, and so on. So I know that in the past, when I have crossed that line, and I've gone from caring for someone to taking care of them, I have really done it with the best of intentions. You know, I've wanted to do it because usually it's not fun. It's a really unpleasant experience for us, seeing someone that we care deeply about in pain or being hurt or being angry and so on. So it comes from a place of love. But ultimately, when we take care of someone and when we take responsibility for them, what we are also doing is taking that responsibility from them and taking power from them as well. So we're actually denying them the chance to take responsibility for the situation. And although we're doing it with the best of intentions, we end up disempowering people when we take care of them rather than just being there to support them and love them and let them make their own way. Obviously, there's going to be some people in life that we need to take care of. And I'm talking about like very young people, like kids and babies, very old people, um, sick people. You know, there will always be times in life where we encounter people that need to be taken care of for various reasons. And this is where what I was saying earlier about boundaries being an art, not a science comes in. You know, there are not necessarily any rules about when it's OK to take care of someone and when it's probably better just to, to care for them. The art for us is to recognize um, when it's time to take care of someone and when actually it might be kinder to encourage them to take care of themselves and be there for them on that journey, but not try and take that journey for them. As well as working in our relationship with other people um, in terms of stuff that's going on in their life, this can also work for us as well. Um, so there might be times when we are going through a particularly difficult period or when circumstances pile up, something happens, um, something in life kind of blindsides us and we end up feeling very helpless or very victimized or feelings like that and we don't know what to do. And in those kinds of times, maybe we want someone to come and take care of stuff for us, maybe to rescue us a little bit or to sort out the situation for us. I know I've definitely been in situations in the past where I have sat back and just thought, wow, I wish someone would just come and like sort all this out for me right now because this feels really overwhelming. And it's a horrible place to be in, in that situation. But at the same time, in some ways, having that thought and noticing that thought can be quite helpful because that is a point where we have a choice. We can choose to stay in that place of feeling helpless and feeling victimized, 
or we can choose to take that responsibility back. And instead of waiting for someone to maybe come like riding in on a white horse and <laughs> sort everything out for us, um, to use this as an opportunity to take back that power ourselves and take that responsibility and open up opportunity, new opportunities and possibilities for ourselves. Big idea number five, be a freedom advocate. Just as there's a difference between caring for someone and taking care of them, there is a big difference between sharing our opinions, our feedback, our thoughts, our perspectives, and our advice with people, and expecting them to live their lives in the way that we think they should live them. So just because we think that something is the right path for someone doesn't mean it is the right path for them. And equally for other people, just because somebody else in our lives might think that a certain path is the right path for us, maybe because it was the right path for them in the past, doesn't mean that it is actually the right path for us. What this really comes down to and what being a freedom advocate is all about is recognizing that we can influence other people, but we can't control them. So we can absolutely um, try and persuade people, we can advise people, we can share our perspective, our feedback with people on what's going on in their lives, what we think in general, and so on. But we cannot control the outcome of what they decide to do. That has to be their decision. Remember, we want to care for people, not take care of them. If you're ever in a position, um, as I know that I can be sometimes for sure, I'm not immune to this, where I think that somebody should live their lives in a certain way and they're not doing that and they're breaking that expectation that I have, or equally when we might be breaking other people's expectations of us. Think of this phrase, I want to be a freedom advocate. I want to be a freedom advocate. And just notice how expansive it feels to let go of those expectations and to let go of that need to either control someone else's life or feeling under control of somebody else's opinions. Freedom is expansive. Freedom is completely expansive, both for us and for the people around us when we embody that attitude. So be a freedom advocate. Big idea number six, ask yourself, where am I placing my energy and attention? So just as healthy boundaries includes how we relate to other people in our external world, it also includes how we relate to other people inside our heads as well, and how we think about other people, how much time, energy, and attention we devote to thinking about other people. So to illustrate this point, because I think this quote does it perfectly, I want to share a couple of sentences from Byron Katie. And she says, to think that I know what's best for anybody else is to be out of my business. Even in the name of love, it is pure arrogance. And the result is tension, anxiety, and fear. Do I know what's right for me? That is my only business. Let me work with that before I try to solve problems with for you. So that is Byron Katie serving up some no-nonsense, <laughs> BS-free, straight-talking advice right there and speaking the truth, absolutely. Um, we want to look after our own houses before we start trying to sort out other people's. So what this means is that basically thinking about, you know, worrying about being preoccupied about um, I don't know about you, but I've had the experience before where I always think that if I worry enough about someone, that that's going to change something for them, even though I'm not, <laughs> not in communication with them necessarily. Um, of course, it's not, you know, my sort of mind vibes are not necessarily going to help them with anything. Um, I might think that. And also gossiping is another uh, thing that comes under this heading of like, where am I placing my energy and attention? This is a really huge one, gossiping. So are we thinking or gossiping about other people's business? And if so, you know, A, not only is that probably not very good for our relationship with other people, um, even if we're gossiping about someone when they're not there, I don't know about you, but again, when I've been around people who have gossiped, I've automatically had the thought, wow, I bet they do this about me when I'm not here. Like it's so, so undermining to trust and relationships to put all our energy and attention on other people. Another reason it's also really damaging is it damages our relationship with ourselves as well. Because when we are placing our energy and our attention on other people, we only have a finite amount 
of that energy and attention. So when we're focusing it on other people, we are taking it away from focusing on ourselves or as Byron Katie puts it, on our business. So what I'd like you to do is just to notice going forward from this class, when are the times when maybe you get caught up in somebody else's business? And, you know, I just want to say, like, I think it's a very human thing to do that. I know that, as I said, I'm not immune to this. Um, I certainly do it sometimes. So it's not about judging ourselves. It's just about noticing when we do it, because when we can develop that awareness, then we have the opportunity to switch it around and ask ourselves, OK, what could or what would I do differently if I diverted that energy that I'm spending on other people back to my own business? Like, What would be different in my life if I were taking this energy and this attention that I'm right now focusing on other people and if I invested it in my own business and in bettering my own life? Big idea number seven, notice how you talk about and spend your time. So when I talk about noticing how you talk about and spend your time, what I mean is, are you giving time away and feeling resentful? Um, does how you spend your time match your values and priorities? And also when it comes to time, because how we treat time says a lot about how we treat boundaries in general. Are we respectful of our own time? And are we respectful of other people's time too? One of the main ways that our relationship with time shows up in our language is that sometimes we, you know, we accumulate certain commitments or routines or habits or activities in our lives that can start to feel a little bit like obligations, especially if we have quite a full schedule or we have a lot going on. And what we might find is that in those times we start to use the phrase, I have to do this. So I have to do this, I should do X, Y, Z, I need to do the laundry, whatever. When actually the truth is, if we're going to be really, really truthful and really straight about it, is that those are things that we're choosing to do. That's how we're choosing to spend our time. So when it comes to boundaries and cultivating healthy boundaries around how we spend our time and doing so in a way that allows us to live an authentic life, there's one really useful litmus test that you can use. Next time you find yourself saying, I have to do X, Y, Z, or I should do this, or I need to do that, what I'd like you to do is just stand up and say out loud, I choose to do whatever it is. So um, one that comes up quite often for me is I have to do the cleaning. The cleaning isn't something I particularly enjoy. <laughs> I, I know the benefits of it. I know it's a good thing to do. But um, I quite frequently find myself saying, I have to do this. I have to do the cleaning. And so in that situation, what you do is you stand up and you say out loud. And saying it out loud is really, really important because it has way more impact than just saying it in our heads. I choose to do the cleaning or I choose to do whatever it is you want to do. And then just notice how that feels. So for me, when I stand up and I say I choose to do the cleaning, that actually feels quite empowering because I know that once I've done the cleaning, I love having a clean flat. I love the benefit that it brings. I love the lack of clutter, the sense of orderliness. I just I really like it. It brings me like a real sense of pride. So that actually feels really empowering for me. So if you have the same experience and it feels empowering for you, that is great. Keep doing whatever it is you're doing and keep saying to yourself, I choose to do this. If, however, you stand up and say, I choose to do blah, 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 and it feels a little bit wrong or a little bit kind of weird or icky, then that is really, really important to know because it could very well be that whatever it is you're saying that about is not aligned with your values or with your priorities. It's not something that really fits with your vision for your authentic life. So then once you have that information, once you have that gut response, you can take that and think, OK, well, how can I change this thing to make it more aligned with what I want my authentic life to look like? Or how can I just cut it out of my life altogether? So that's a really useful litmus test that you can use next time you feel kind of obligated to do something, next time you're not really feeling the motivation um, to get back in touch with A, um, either what it is you want to do, or B, uh, how you can change it or remove it from your life altogether. Big idea number eight, check your defenses. This big idea is really about um, the subtle but very important difference between boundaries and defenses. I know I've certainly had times in my life when I have thought I was asserting boundaries with people, when in hindsight I look back 
And actually, I was just being kind of defensive with them. I just wasn't super aware of it at the time. So when we suffer pain or heartbreak or we have challenging or negative experiences that provoke like really strong emotions in us, maybe leave us with a lot of stuff to process, uh, we can unconsciously close parts of ourselves off from other people and cultivate beliefs that are actually not very helpful to us um, around that incident or around that situation. Um, so for example, if we have a very difficult breakup, we might unconsciously cultivate the belief that when I trust people, they end up letting me down, or when I trust people, they end up abandoning me. That's just one example. We do this for protection, right? We do it because we've been hurt or we've had this negative experience and in our minds, we're like, I don't want this to happen again, so I'm not going to let it happen again. And we close those parts of ourselves off. But actually developing these defenses and acting according to these beliefs does us more harm than good. We do it for our protection, but it doesn't actually help us. The reason is because when we put up defenses, defenses are like those walls that I was talking about earlier. You know, boundaries are gates or doors. Defenses are walls because they don't discriminate. They keep everybody out. So they keep the bad out, but they also keep the good out too. So in order to identify your defenses and start that process, and it's not an overnight thing, it's definitely something that requires like attention and care and compassion for yourself, um, to start that process of switching your, your defenses out for healthier boundaries, um, think about the beliefs that you have that apply to everybody. So notice how you might talk about things. Quite One that comes up quite often um, is that people will let you down if you let them, right? If you let people close enough, they'll just eventually let you down. Notice where maybe you have these thoughts in your life where these really big generalizations come up that you're applying to everybody. That's usually a sign that it's a defense. And then as you move forward, start treating people as individuals, right? Start taking each individual case as it comes, just carrying on with that example, um, certainly you, there will definitely be people who absolutely, if you trust them, will let you down, okay? And that's, it's hard, but it's also quite useful information to have about that person. On the other hand, there will also be people who, if you trust them, will absolutely return that trust tenfold and prove that belief wrong and actually be a really, really positive influence on your life. So remember that defenses are walls and boundaries are gates and you really want to make sure that you're allowing space in your life to let the good in, to let that positive stuff in, as well as keep the bad out. Big idea number nine, make requests, not demands. So I, earlier I talked about how we can influence other people, but we can't control them. And this especially applies to how people feel. It's really, really common. In fact, one of the most common things that I end up talking to clients and friends about is taking responsibility for other people's feelings. So, of course, we don't want to hurt people. You know, we don't want to annoy people or upset them or leave them feeling offended or any of that kind of stuff. You know, no one wants to do that. And so it's really, really natural that we worry about how people will respond to us asserting our boundaries, you know, how people might respond to us saying no, how people might respond to us setting limits that feel right for us, but it may be quite different to any limits that have been set with them before. The important thing to remember is that there is no such thing as right or wrong boundaries. You know, just as I said earlier, I probably have very different boundaries in some ways to you. That doesn't mean that mine are any better than yours or, uh, writer, for want of a better word, than yours, or yours are kind of like wrong in some way or invalid. They're just different. So when it comes to communicating our boundaries with other people, we really need to remember that what our responsibility is, is communicating them uh, as clearly, as compassionately, and as respectfully as possible. And how people feel as a result of that communication is ultimately their responsibility. Like I said earlier, we can definitely influence this. If I said something to you in a very blunt way, and you know you would probably not feel so great as a result of me saying that, um, 
and it, you probably have quite a different emotional experience if I said it to you um, in that clear, compassionate and respectful way that I was just talking about. So we definitely want to take responsibility for checking how we're communicating with people because that will influence how people feel as a result and ultimately how they respond as a result of what we're saying. But we want to remember that we can't ultimately take control for how they choose to interpret what we're saying and how they choose to feel as a result of that. So what does clear communication mean? Really, when it comes to boundaries, it looks like requests. So when I say it looks like requests, I mean requests as opposed to things like dropping hints or maybe being slightly passive aggressive if we're annoyed with someone or dancing around the topic and so on and so forth. When it comes to setting our boundaries and when it comes to sharing our boundaries with other people, we want to make it as easy as possible for them to agree with us. And we want to make it as easy as possible for them to say yes. And we do this by making clear requests of people and being clear with them about where our boundaries are. When we kind of dance around the topic, and I know quite a lot about this because I'm British, <laughs> when we dance around the topic or when we, um, you know, when we can get slightly passive aggressive or when we communicate through body language instead of through words, um, we're not making it very easy for people to agree with us because most of the time they probably don't know, they're not mind readers, they probably don't even know what it is we're really trying to communicate to them. So we want to be really, really clear in our requests to other people. And at the same time, we want to remember that requests are not the same as demands. When we make requests of other people, they are absolutely free to agree or to decline as they wish. Again, we cannot control that. What we can control is how we make the request and how clear we are. Um, but it is the other person's responsibility, just as it's responsibility, their responsibility as to how they feel. It's their responsibility as to how they respond as well, because that's their life and that's up to them. But when we make requests, even if the other person declines, we are still opening up space. We're opening up space for negotiation. We're opening up lots of possibilities. And we're opening up a really expansive space that we're then holding to come to a win-win situation or a win-win agreement at the end of it that is right for both people. When we make demands, on the other hand, we are constricting the conversation instead of expanding it. We are shrinking it down only into two possibilities, um, which to use the saying is like my way or the highway, right? It's, it's either this way or it doesn't happen at all. And when we do that, we back the conversation into a corner, which is really, really not productive for us. So when it comes to expressing our boundaries with people, we A, want to remember that we are what we're responsible for is how we communicate those boundaries. And we also want to focus on making requests, not demands, and honoring that the other person is going to uh, respond in a way that is right for them. Big idea number 10, and the final big idea for today, is don't just say, do. So there's a saying that honesty is when your words match your actions, and integrity is when your actions match your words. And that's what boundaries are really about. We want both honesty and integrity when we live with boundaries. And we want honesty and integrity as we cultivate an authentic life as well. Those two values are really key values of authenticity. So boundaries are about action. Ultimately, we can talk about boundaries all we want, but where boundaries really show up is in what we do. So we need to look at what we're doing rather than what we're saying. And equally, when it comes to boundaries with other people, we need to look at what other people are doing rather than just at what they're saying. Boundaries are ultimately, as I mentioned at the very beginning of this class, you know, really key part of boundaries is keeping commitments we make, whether to ourselves and to others. And this is where the doing part also comes in, when we can make commitments to ourselves and to other people, and when we keep those commitments, we cultivate trust, we deepen our relationships, whether that's with ourselves or with other people. And especially when we make commitments to ourselves and keep them, we give ourselves space to live with much greater authenticity. So thanks so much for watching this class today. I really hope it has been helpful for you as you think about how to cultivate healthy boundaries in your own life and live with more authenticity. Um, I would love to hear which of these 10 big ideas resonated with you the most. So if you're a member of the Oasis, please feel free to go ahead and leave a comment below this class and share which of the ideas resonated with you.
if you have any questions um, about this class or about boundaries in general, feel free to email me at Hannah, that's H-A-N-N-A-H, at becomingwhoyouare.net. Thanks so much for listening, and I hope you have a very beautiful and boundaried day. <laughs>